Glory to God forever. Welcome to South Harbor Creek Church, the uh, electronic streaming version of the church. It's a wonder and privilege to minister to you today. The doldrums of summer are kicking in, the humdrums of life. Matter of fact, the church calendar says we're in ordinary time now. That's the time between Pentecost and Advent. And sometimes it just seems ordinary. So I want to thank you for taking 50 minutes of your Sunday morning to join us in this time of worship. And we pray that God would use this service to be encouraging to you. Uh, it's the 4th of July weekend. We celebrate as Americans Independence Day. I saw uh, the streaming version of the broadcast Alexander Hamilton, uh, the Broadway version of the play. It was televised on streaming on Friday. And I was reminded that it's a lot easier to win the war than it is to govern the nation, one of the lines from the play. And sometimes it's a lot easier to make a decision for Jesus, but living life day to day is sometimes a challenge. So we want to thank you again for sharing with us and allowing us to be a part of your world. More than that, that God would be a part of your world and that God would use this time. A couple of announcements. Number one, uh, online, on the website, we have a copy of the order of service for you. On the back is the scripture reading. And also attached to that is ways to pray for your church as it prepares to reopen. Next Sunday, the 12th of July, uh, we'll be open for anyone who wants to join us live in person for worship. Now, it's changed a lot. We'll have a video posted to the website probably on Tuesday that will share with you what to expect as you come in. Temperatures, uh, distancing, uh, we really would like to have record or a notice that you're planning on coming. 899-5962, if you would call the church office before Friday, or come to the uh, church website and click on that you'd like to send a message or contact. Uh, it helps us prepare, particularly as we're still learning how to best prepare for a safe worship experience for everybody. And for the first couple weeks, if we have a, have a record of who's coming, we can properly think through the, the right seating configurations for you. And uh, as you join us in delivering a worship service to the streaming church, uh, we're told that somewhere between 400 to 600 people uh, share in this streaming service every Sunday in one form or another. So you would be a part of that worship experience, not only to be worshipful yourself, but to share in the ministry to others. So we welcome you to come. Uh, if you're not comfortable coming, Stay home. Take advantage of what's available to you through streaming. We'll continue to add devotions in the morning. We'll do continue to add ministries going into the fall. And uh, for us, the streaming ministry, electronic church, is a part of uh, how we're going to do ministry going forward. Uh, please let the church know by Friday. Uh, you've got the website, temperatures, masks, social distancing. We'd like to have everyone in their seats by 945. We have a devotional for the praise team and the worship participants at 945, and then that, and that leads us into the uh, prelude that uh, you hear Linda play as we prepare ourselves for worship. Will you bow your heads in prayer as we invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit to worship with us, in us, and through us? Almighty God, may the transforming power of your gospel be at work in our lives today. Wherever we're at, we know that we need to center ourselves on you. So draw us close to the core of your heart that we might feel you and that you might lift us up with eagle's wings. Pray blessing and grace upon this service and all those who might share in it throughout today. In Jesus' name, amen.
God of wonders, God of majesty. As our country celebrates its political independence, we as Christians celebrate spiritual independence. And one of the parts of that spiritual independence is the belief that the God of wonders, the God of creation, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, cares about you and I and each of us. That the God of creation has not forgotten that creation, but stands ready to meet us where we're at and to touch us where we need. Please join with the praise team as they sing about the wonders and majesty of God Almighty, the God we worship. For those that are here, please stand. For those at home, you're welcome to stand or sit, but uh, enjoy. To the Lord of heaven and earth, we have Miss Adrian to give us a children's message for this holiday weekend. Adrian, what do you have for us today? Good morning, everybody. So this is a holiday weekend, and I thought, hmm. I wonder what the actual definition of a holiday is, so I didn't look it up in the dictionary. I will admit that. I Googled it, and Google said that, I think it was a website of a dictionary that Google referenced, but it said that a holiday is a day of festivity or recreation when no work is done. And I thought, well, that's kind of true. If you're a little person, there's probably no work done. But if you're a big person, you probably did a picnic and you probably did cooking, so you probably did some work. And we know that there are some people who do have to go to work, so... I thought it was an okay definition. But what really are we celebrating on the 4th of July? And Pastor talked about it a little bit, but the 4th of July is that day that we celebrate and we remember the days, or the day or days actually, that our founding fathers came together and, and they wrote and they drafted and they approved what was called the Declaration of Independence. And they signed it on July 4th, 1777. So that's why we have Independence Day or Declaration Day. And I have to say that when I went to Independence Hall in Philadelphia, it was old and it was, I envisioned it to be much bigger, but it was very, very small. And I have to imagine it was probably really hot. 
that's like the one thing that I think about when I think about the writing of the Declaration of Independence is how hot it probably was. That's just a side note. But, you know, this declaration that really was life-changing, it wasn't really that big of a document. I looked it up and it said that it was 1,336 words, and that doesn't count the signatures. But it's so important. This was a document that they wrote, the American, the Founding Fathers wrote, to say to the King of England, look, enough is enough. We don't want to play by your rules anymore. We want to be our own people, and we're going to make our own rules in our own country. But it also was written to encourage the colonists or the people that came over from England to live there in, in the new colonies, what would be the, later the United States. But what they were really looking for was this freedom from England or from the king's rule. And, you know, you've probably heard the words from the, um, some of the, what would be the preamble of the Declaration, and it says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You've probably heard that, and that's what we're talking about. That's the Declaration of Independence. So with that being what we celebrate on the holiday, I gotta be a little bit honest with you. Holidays are fun, but they kind of make me sad because it seems like we get so excited and we anticipate and we plan and we have this party and people are coming and just like that, it's over. And for little kids, it seems like the day is long, but for big people, it's true. As you get older, the days go faster. And it seems like we're always left with counting down to things. What's coming next? The weekend's coming or this is the next big day. And you know, in 118 days is Halloween, and in 173 days is Christmas, and 180 days is New, um, New Year's, 273 days we'll celebrate Easter, and because it's not a leap year, next year we will celebrate 4th of July again in 364 days. But what happens when it's not the holiday? Do we still celebrate that we're free? Are we still free today on July 5th? What about Easter? We know that that's the day that we celebrate the resurrection, and that's when we say that we won, that Jesus won, he conquered the grave, and we are free. Do we only celebrate that on Easter, or do we celebrate that every day? And, you know, that is the day that marks what we believe as Christians, but there is a day that you and I and, and us, everybody as Christians, gave their life to Jesus, and they said, I want to follow you, I want to love you, that I believe you're my Lord and Savior. So do we only celebrate that one day, or do we celebrate that every day? And so that made me think, if we're celebrating something every single day, there is nothing to count down for, is there? Where do you count down to when it's every day it's happening? So here's my challenge. My challenge is not to count down to the days, but rather make every day count. Can you live that you are a follower of God? John, eight thir er, John chapter 8, verse 36 says, So if the Son has set you free, you will be free indeed. And so I want to challenge you, make each day count. I want you to live like you are a person that God has been set free and that you can do great things because you're free indeed. Have Amen. a good day. Thanks, Adrian. The scripture reading for, day, for today comes from John chapter 8, verses 25 through 36. Then the religious leaders asked, Who are you? Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is trustworthy, and what I have heard from him I'll tell the world. They did not understand what he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. Even as he spoke, many believed in him. To the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. 
Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the word of God for the people of God. This morning I'm going to lead you in a prayer for our country, and then we'll go into the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we come to honor you this day. We come to acknowledge that you are the only one who can rightly lead us and guide our country. Lord, we lift up, in, we lift up prayer for our country. We ask that you would bless our country with your wisdom, your love, and your compassion. May we be a people who are pursuing you and your plans for us, individually and corporately. Lord, we lift up prayer for our leaders. Lord, we ask for blessing on our leaders. May these servants who are in positions of authority take that responsibility seriously and do their very best each day. May they realize their need for you and your direction. May they hear your voice as they make their decisions. And may they follow your guidance. May they have a passion for people, for truth, and for righteousness. Lord, we lift up a prayer for our troops. Lord, we ask for blessings on our servicemen and women. We ask protection for all of our men and women in uniform, both here and around the world. We are grateful for their service and their dedication to keeping our nation safe. We pray that you would keep them safe. We thank you for our blessings of life and liberty. May our country continually show love and honor to you. May our dedication to you cause us to reach out to all the other nations and people groups with a strong desire for peace and harmony to be, split, to be displayed whenever possible. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son. Amen. Please join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Linda. You're not Sue. You're not Linda. <laughs> thank you, Sue. And thank you, Linda. Uh, we're going to run a video, actually, before we do the hymn. So it's going to be, be just, just, a, just, just a couple minutes. Uh, we were going to sing the doxology at this point. We're not. But I do want to recognize the generosity of this congregation, the support. Uh, the technology pro uh, program that was about $12,000 has been totally paid for, so we thank you for those gifts. Operationally, we're in the red, but not very much, and uh, we're not sure what the summer holds, but we're very grateful to be in the position we are, and it's because of your investment in this ministry as we continue to look for ways to minister to an online and uh, streaming uh, community, so we're looking forward to that. The second thing is I do want to play a, well, two videos. I want to play one video that's got a provocative and a thought-provoking ending. So be sure to watch it right to the ending slides. And then I'll say a word or two, and then it will give us a video prayer for our country as well uh, with some music in the background. Watch this first video uh, about the signing of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal. That they are endowed by the Creator. With certain unalienable rights. That among these are life. Liberty. And the pursuit of happiness. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, for the support of this declaration, mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortunes and, and our, our sacred, sacred honor. honor
that word from some of the descendants of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. I want you to know, I think I already shared, I thoroughly enjoyed the Broadway production of Alexander Hamilton, how an immigrant from the Caribbean, an orphan, made a difference in our country's history. It must have been a wild time as, as, as our country was, was, was coming to formation and the idea of, of breaking from England from a stronger power was almost unheard of. Yet spiritually, we too break from a stronger power because of the independence of Jesus. We heard it in Sue's reading of Scripture. We heard it in Adrian's uh, children's message. When Jesus says that you are free, you are free indeed. Will you join with me for this video prayer that uh, helps focus our thoughts before I give a short introduction to, to, to today's hymn? Join us in this time of prayer. God, on the day we celebrate our nation's birth, we place our faith in you. You are the one who gives us freedom. You have endowed us with inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And may we pursue you with the passion that you first pursued us. As we celebrate our great nation, we remember the sacrifice and turmoil that this country was born out of and that continues to shape us today. We know that you are not done here. We know that we are far from perfect, and we know that you have a plan. We pause to remember that you are our God, and we are the people of your pasture. Help our country turn toward you. Bring revival to this nation. Give our leaders clear vision and sober minds. Bring peace and justice to our schools and unite us all as brothers and sisters. God, we ask that your kingdom would come and come quickly. May peace and prosperity come to your children living in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Amen. Amen. Chris Leffler and Linda Morey are going to lead us in today's hymn. The hymn is called For the Healing of the Nations. It's a relatively new hymn. It was, the lyrics were written in 1965, but the inspiration comes from the book of Revelations. Revelations chapter 22, verse 2, talks about the new heaven and the new earth, and here in the new earth there's a, a river running through the heavenly city. And on either side is the tree of life, and the leaves of the tree of life will heal the nations. For those that are here, please stand and join with us in, in quiet singing. And for those that are at home, listen to the words, the healing of the nations. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Linda. I don't know what's wrong with me today. It must have been those hot dogs yesterday. I don't know. Gosh. <laughs> I work with these women, and they, uh, I don't know. I pray that I don't call my wife Linda by any other name than Linda. Gosh, that could be messy. Just a comment about what we're doing uh, as far as um, masking and distancing and some of those things. Uh, when you come to church with us, for those that decide to or will share in that, we have lines marked on the floor, this side of which the praise team and the participants are sitting. And uh, it's marked more than 22 feet. Uh, I remember when I used to, as a child, go to a place called SeaWorld or Marineland. And I always wanted to sit in the splash zone. I wanted to get soaked and wet. And we've learned with COVID, you don't want to get soaked and wet, and you don't want to be in the splash zone. So we have the line here where the congregants and the participants in the, in the live service will be sitting. Those of us who are participating are, are distancing and, and wearing the masks when we're not singing or, or otherwise talking. So that's kind of how we've protected uh, our spaces, and that's how we're going about that today. I hope that uh, relieves or, or responds to some questions you might have. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege of delivering your word to your people today. I pray, Lord, for an eloquent tongue. More, I pray for a revived and anointed spirit. That we might be focused on you and what you can do for us, that we can do not for ourselves, but you can. For you can always lift us up. You can always meet us where we're needed, and you can always touch us where we need the healing the most. For in you there is life indeed. Amen. The question of the sermon is, when Jesus says you are alive, you are alive indeed. And I ask you, are you alive indeed? It was May 25th, 1961. May 25th. 1961. I was two years old, and I remember that day well. I think you would, too. Let me tell you what happened on that day. May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy addressed Congress asking for permission to enter into the space race where within a decade the United States would put a man on the moon. Boots on the ground, if you will. A man on the moon within 10 years. It began for this country an exhilarating time of science and exploration and discovery. All kinds of discoveries happened during that time. It was exciting. We have some people in our church who participated either at NASA or some of the aeronautical companies, and they share with me it was a time of cowboys doing wonderful and wild things. It was a time of experimentation. At the beginning of this time, there weren't even computers. They were using slide rules to make the calculations for the initial space flights. A movie, Divine Beings, was made about some of the women that mathematically supported the calculations of those early space flights. Every week, every month, every year, there was discoveries being reported and they're saying, wow, this is cool. We're learning about the moon. We're learning about space. We're learning about technology. And every step, there was another marvel. And it seemed like every marvel was more than the marvel before. And then finally, July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon. One small step for mankind. One, how did that go? One one small step for man, one giant step for humanity, breaking into a new frontier. And stepping on the moon was a culminating moment. 
a significant moment, a pivotal moment. And even since then, the things that happen in that pivotal moment have determined what is happening with space exploration, technology and development of all kinds. Space labs, science labs, robots and satellites, everything pivots off of that commitment and that culminating moment. Now, how does this relate to today's sermon? We've been studying for the past number of weeks the miracles of Jesus. We've been looking at, beginning with the wedding at Cana, Jesus' first miracle, turning the water into wine. We've learned some things, kind of like the space program. In the space program, every problem they faced, they found a way to work around it. In the working around the problem, there was personal discoveries, and people learned about each other, and they learned about things, and there was a, a, another level of experience that went beyond the solving of the need or the problem. And ultimately, they learned more about the science of the moon, the science of space, that allowed the ultimate achievement of walking on the moon. You know, that's similar to the way it is with miracles. Every miracle that's recorded in the Bible meets an immediate desperate need. Do you have a need in your life today? It's a desperate need. We saw the woman reaching out to touch the cloak of Jesus. Jarius asking Jesus to heal his daughter. We learned the lepers, the blind, the lame, the sick. We saw the disciples in the boat afraid. Yet Jesus could calm nature. And what we learned is not only did the immediate need get met, but that we learn something about ourselves and about Jesus. And, and on almost every case, our relationship with Jesus would go further on a personal level. But we also saw that behind the miracles, we saw and learned something more about Jesus, about God. Now remember, perhaps the greatest miracle is the miracle we're going to share today. I think the greatest miracle is the God of wonders, the God of majesty, the God of all-knowing, the God of all power, squeezed into a human form so that not only could he do what we could not do for ourselves, but so that humanity would have a sense of what it is to live as Christ would have us live. Not only as an example, but also as an image of God that we might begin to comprehend and understand. I talked to scientists that were part of the space program in the early 60s, and space was incomprehensible to them. As they comprehended it, they learned years later that they didn't even grasp a, a little iota of what was there. And isn't that the way it is with God? That as we see God at this level, we then move into seeing God at a bigger level and a more spectacular level. It's a progression. That's one of the things I like about the Christian faith. It's, it's a faith that grows, and it's a faith that we continually see new dimensions of God, and we learn new dimensions and needs of ourselves. So in faith, we commit all that we know of ourselves to all that we know of God. Each day, it's like a little revival experience as we learn more about us, more about our needs, and more about God's wonder. We grow spiritually, and we grow day by day. We look at these miracles. The miracle of incarnation. The miracle of God of wonders condescending, giving up some of his divine powers so that he could live within our world on our terms and show us that he has experienced all the pain, all the heartache, all the experiences that we now share. Jesus was a part of he lived and survived those without sin. He overcame the power of sin, which was death itself. But let me share with you what the power of incarnation and resurrection means to us. It means that we're forgiven. Boy, does it help when I feel forgiven. Being a klutzy husband, I more often than I should do things I'm sorry for at home and with Linda, my wife. I'm forever saying I'm sorry. And boy, when she puts her arms around me and gives me a hug and says, Keith, I love you. Keith, it's okay. Keith, 
Yeah, you're a klutz. I love you anyway. I don't know if that's so good or not. She doesn't say that. She loves me without qualification. I want you to know that God loves you without qualification. God has forgiven all of us. Now, what, what is sin? God's forgiven sin. What is sin? Sin is anything that separates us from God, ourselves, or others. So sin results in separation. Forgiveness results in healing, in unity. And when the gift of forgiveness is granted, unity and restoration begin. God's forgiveness makes the possibility of united restoration possible. Not always in the perfect of circumstances, but whatever circumstance we're in, God will take us from where we are to where we could be in his very best will for us at that point in time. God brings restoration. Number two, the miracle of incarnation and the miracle of resurrection brings a divine spark that restores humanity to the way we were in the garden before original sin. You see, we had a spiritual void in our lives, and with the Holy Spirit and with the, with, with the victory of resurrection. Remember in John 14, Jesus says to the disciples, I will leave to you one that will comfort you and strengthen you. I will leave you one that will never leave you, that will be with you. That's the Holy Spirit. And this divine spark is given to all those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ with faith, with action, with commitment. Divine spark. Whoa, you're coming alive. The Holy Spirit in you, going from death to life. So not only are we forgiven, but we're given a divine spark, a divine spirit that can be cultivated and grown within us, that can be our guide, that can be our, our comfort, that can be our inspiration. God, give me an idea of what to do. That's the Holy Spirit working out in you. Some of my best ideas, I know, come from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit inside of me. But not only are we forgiven, not only are we, are we given a divine spark in the Holy Spirit, but we're made a part of the royal family of God. Your royalty, John chapter 1 says, to all those who believe, become children of God. We go from being outside the family to being adopted into the family. Pretty cool. Adopted into the family of God. And as part of royalty, we have royal responsibilities and royal opportunities. And we're expected to live according to our royalty and our place with God. It hurts me because I think that we as Christians too often live beneath what God intends for us to live. As a parent, I love to bestow blessing upon my family. Even more, God loves to bestow blessing on his family. Yet do we receive it? Do we live according to it? Do we live according to the enabling that God has intended for us to do for the responsibilities of making the world a better place, of, of being a divine agent and ambassador to do the work of God, to be the feet and the hands of Jesus with royal responsibilities? We hear about the royal family in England and how they have royal responsibilities. We as children of God have royal responsibilities, but more than that, we are adopted into a family that is forever and ever, regardless of what our family might be here in this world. The family of God. The God of wonders, the God of creation cares enough about us to welcome us into his family, to give us a divine spark, and to forgive us that our, our relationships with God, ourselves, and others might be restored. And fourth, as a result of the incarnation and as a result of the resurrection, we are also given a promise, a person, and a presence of God. We are told that Jesus will come again. We look forward to a new heaven and a new earth where all things are made right, all things wrong, and all the injustices are set aside, and we have a new heaven and a new earth. So not only do we have the Holy Spirit with us today, but we have the promise of tomorrow. We have the presence of God with us that allows us to grow in sanctification. Now, what does that mean? That means that we can grow in Christian life and Christian perfection. I'm a very poor golfer, but I live and I have the prospect of hitting a perfect golf shot. And occasionally, it's almost perfect, and it feels wonderful. Then I want to hit two perfect shots and three perfect shots. And we as human beings have the chance to live according to God's will. 
a little bit at first. And the more we practice, the more we live, the more we turn over control to the Holy Spirit, the more divinely we live, we do better and better and better, more and more, never achieving ultimate perfection. But we grow in the Christian life and Christian perfection because of the promise that God loves us, God will come again, all things will be made right, and we will be made whole. You see, being a Christian isn't only for the day to come, but it's for the day present. And God is with us. God helps us. God uh, enables us. And God gives us strength. How can we take advantage of this? How can we experience this? We're forgiven. Our relationships have the capacity of being made right. We're given a divine spark, the Holy Spirit. We are given adoption into the royal family of God. And we're given the hope and the promise of a better world to come, a growing peace, a growing presence of God in us. How can we do this? A well-known verse, which many people quote, particularly on Independence Day, is 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek the face of God and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. This is a promise that God gave to King Solomon, encouraging King Solomon and his people to humble themselves, to pray, to turn from their wicked ways. And he will hear them, and he will forgive them, and he will heal their land. Now, this passage is often incorrectly interpreted in today's world. This passage was given by God to God's people in a theocracy. A theocracy is where where God is the political head of the people. And in the Old Testament, the people of Israel their king, their, their, their sovereign was God Almighty. That has gone away. Since the days of Jesus, we don't have a theocracy in the world today. I know that Americans like to quote that verse for God's blessing upon America, and I know that people in other lands claim that verse for whatever land they're from. But the intention of this verse is for Christians, for people in the family of God, for people that are children of God, If my people, if my children who are called by name, called Christians, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them, I will forgive their sins, I will restore them, I will lift them up, and I will heal their land. The best thing we can do to help America or whatever country we're from is for Christians to live rightly. What does 2 Chronicles 7.14 say to us? Be humble. Be humble. We need help. We can't do it on our own. Remember all the miracles of Jesus. We saw someone stepping forward saying to Jesus, we need help. The disciples in the boat, we're afraid. The leper, help me. The cripple by the pool, I can't walk. Jesus says, do you want to walk? I do want to walk. Look at me. And Jesus healed him. But we need to humble ourselves and say, we can't do this on our own. We need help. Then we have to have a hunger for God. There's other words here, but it exhibits a passion of wanting things to be the way God wants them to be. I was talking to someone recently whose father had passed some years ago. And that person shared that he or she thinks almost every day about what dad would have wanted, what dad would have said, and what dad would have blessed. You see, this person was living an admirable life with the sense of what would God want? What would dad want? Do you want what God wants? Not only for your life, but for your land, for your family. And whatever God wants is what we should hunger after. Yesterday, I had a light breakfast, almost no lunch, and by the time it was dinner time, I was hungry. Do I hunger after God the way that I hunger after my physical appetite for food? Do you hunger after God? Are you humble? Do you admit that you can't do it by yourself and you need the help and you turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, help me? 
Do you desire what God desires? And are you committed to being holy? This verse says, turn from your wicked ways. What it's really saying is, the way Peter writes it in 1 Peter, we are called to be a holy people, to live according to the precepts of the Bible, of God's rules, to live according to the owner's manual, if you will. Humility, hunger, and holiness. We turn to the scripture that Sue read. Not Linda, but Sue. Sue reads and, uh, from John chapter 8. Jesus is talking with the religious leaders and said at the beginning of the passage, before Sue even started to read, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus is making these bold claims that if you turn to me, Jesus will help you, he says. Not, not me, Keith, but if Jesus says, turn to me, turn to him. And Jesus says, I'm going away, and the Pharisees can't quite comprehend a spiritual thing at a physical level. They keep trying to put Jesus into their box rather than open their mind to what Jesus wanted. Isn't that the way the people at NASA were? Every time they tried to tame space into their box, they had problems. Every time they looked at the wonder and the majesty beyond them, it seemed like their eyes were open and they achieved the next step. John Glenn, who he orbited the earth, said, it's unfathomable to him how anyone could see the wonder of creation from orbit and not believe that there's a God. So in this discourse with the Pharisees, Jesus says, I am the light of life. The Pharisees scratch their head, the religious establishment, the people that think they know what they're doing. And they say, who are you? Jesus, who are you? And Jesus went on and said, you should know who I am. If anybody in Jerusalem and in Israel should know who I am, it should be you, the religious world that is tuned into the spiritual, supposedly. And isn't that Jesus saying that to the church today? If anyone should know what I want, it should be the church. It should be the Christians, those who call themselves by my name. I know we call ourselves Christians, but do we live humbly? Do we hunger after God? And do we live holy? As Jesus continues this discourse with the Pharisees in John chapter 8, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Have you ever been bounded and slaved to sin? You do something that takes you out of the sink with God, and you can't even get out of it very quick. It's like getting stuck in a tidal wave, and you get swirled around. It's like getting stuck in quicksand, and you can't get out. It's like getting in the middle of life situations. You've got to take a deep breath and let go and reach up, and Jesus will reach down. The God of wonders comes to our level and does not require us to go to his level, but Jesus comes down and kneels and picks us up and says, I have come for you. See, most other religions require humanity to ascend to God. But in the Christian faith, God descends to humanity and picks us up. Now, unfortunately, as we begin to feel better and do better, we are quick to turn on our own self-will. But to those who persevere, to those that hunger after God, to those that commit their lives to living according to God's precepts, God will make them free indeed. Free indeed. So I ask you, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, you are free indeed. Are you free indeed? Remember, because of the great miracle of incarnation and resurrection, our sins are forgiven. Our relationships can be restored. The divine spark is renewed. We're adopted into the God, family of God as heirs. And we have promise for tomorrow. And what do we do? According to Second Chronicles, we humble ourselves. We hunger after God and we be holy. So remembering as we started about the charge of John F. Kennedy in 1961, Boots on the ground, man on the moon in 10 years. I ask you, will you be people of God? 
Will you commit yourself as this country committed itself in the space race to be people of God? A good friend of mine sent me an encouraging word this week. And he says, wouldn't it be wonderful if Christians would commit to a Bible in every hand, Jesus in every heart, and God's purpose for every life? That's not bad. I'm going to meet with the administrative council this week, and that might become a motto for our church, a Bible in every hand. We should be with the Word of God in our hearts and in our hands. Jesus in every heart and God's purpose in every life. As the praise team comes to sing their last song, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, your words to Solomon that we must humble ourselves. I get down on my knees and I look up to you because you are beyond anything I can imagine. As space was beyond anything we could imagine in the 60s and even today, you are beyond our imagination. You reach your hand down to me and you lift your hand up to me. I lift my hand up to you, you reach down to me. And God, I commit myself as best as I'm able to live the life you want me to live, that the world would be a better place and that they might see Jesus in me, the reconciling love, the justice, the, the rightness of God, promised in Revelations 22 for the healing of the nations right here, right now. God, we commit ourselves to you today for spiritual independence. Amen. challenge you today not to go to the moon, but to be the children that God wants you to be, to be living according to the royalty that he has declared to us as children of God, people of faith, that we be humble 
Let me read to you from Micah, chapter 6. He who has shown you, O human being, what is good. And what does the Lord require? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Adam and Eve got into trouble when they stopped walking with God. We get into trouble when we stop walking with God. I assure you that your days will get better. Your spirit will be lifted if you spend time walking with God. In the words of Second Chronicles, to walk humbly, to hunger after God, and to be holy. Go now and enjoy the holiday weekend. Enjoy your family. Enjoy the picnics. Enjoy the calories and the food, the sunshine and the heat. And I hope you have the best week of the rest of your lives beginning right now. And friends, as I escort and dismiss the congregation back row to the front so that they can walk through without social distancing, please enjoy the praise team as they sing a final song for you today. Amen. Our practice. I'm supposed to just.